Hi, everybody. This is Tracy. Today, I've got a very special guest for us. Dr. Amy Baker is a nationally recognized expert in parent-child relationships, especially children of divorce, parental alienation syndrome, and emotional abuse of children. She's the author of eight books and a coach on parental alienation. She's featured on TV, and she stood up as an expert witness to protect the rights of alienated parents everywhere. She's also a researcher that has created peer-reviewed articles that change the way the medical and legal profession look at parental alienation syndrome. We must remember that everything abusers do is about control. They hate to lose, and they love to further torture their victims. If you're dealing with a parental alienation case, then you're gonna need to hear this. So let's welcome Dr. Amy Baker. Thanks for having me. I look forward to our conversation. You're welcome. Um, I just want to talk about like that divorce is usually pretty ugly and, and, it, and it brings out the worst in people. But sadly, the children are used as pawns to control their exes. And the amount of crazy that happens during divorce can, can make anybody's head spin. But knowing that my audience deals with the additional layer of narcissistic abuse, um, some of the things that, that that parental alienation isn't is is the ways that they can manipulate a schedule or um, having clothing wars and messing with the child's support or even disciplining the children differently. So while these are not parental alienation um, features, they are um, tactics that are used and they're just shitty parenting. So if those aren't parental alienation, what is parental alienation? Well, first of all, I, I'm not sure I'm willing to say that those things are not alienation. Um, when alienation is any action or attitude or behavior on the part of one parent that can foster a child's unjustified rejection of the other parent. So we can't make a list and say fighting over clothing or discipline is or isn't alienation. It's really how the parent does it. In other words, if a parent says, I can't believe your mother let you wear that dress. That's ridiculous. She obviously doesn't love you or she wouldn't have let you dress like that. That's alienation. It just happens mm -hmm. to be about clothing. On the other hand, a parent could just say, I forbid you to wear this outfit or that outfit. I don't care what the other parent says. That's not necessarily alienation. So alienation is anything that can result in a child believing that the other parent is unsafe, unloving, and unavailable. And there's many, many ways that one parent can behave that can foster in a child the belief that the other parent is unsafe, unloving, and unavailable. That's really helpful to know. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, is there any links to um, people who alienate and personality disorders? So in the field, we definitely believe that personality disorders, especially cluster B, that's borderline sociopathy and narcissism, that those three provide a psychic platform for alienation. In other words, a parent who has one of those three personality disorders has difficulty separating their needs from the needs of the child. So that once they devalue the other parent, oh, I'm not married to that jerk anymore, so they've devalued the, their former spouse. It's hard for them to see that the children might benefit from that relationship, even if they no lo longer want a relationship with that parent. That's why narcissism, sociopathy, and borderline can result in alienation. That's really helpful to know. Um, and I know my people are dying to hear that from you, so thank you. Um, I work really closely with the domestic violence world and two words that they don't like, narcissists and parental alienation. They don't like narcissists because they don't care what they're labeled. They care about the behaviors. Um, and with parental alienation, they don't like it because of all the false claims that abusers use against their victim. And it seems like this is a tactic that gets used quite often. Um, and I have a friend whose husband um, had accused 
was accused of assault, sexually assaulting their daughter. And so as retaliation, he claimed parental alienation. So how often does this false claim thing happen? And, and does it um, affect the real cases? So I think the first thing that I want to say is I'm very, very sympathetic to the problem of false allegations of parental alienation. I don't think that a battering husband should be able to get away with saying, oh, it's not that I'm a batterer, it's just these kids have been alienated from me by my ex. So I'm highly sympathetic to that. My problem is I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. In other words, there are false allegations of sexual abuse, but nobody would say, therefore, let's say that sexual abuse doesn't happen. So yes, there might be false allegations of parental alienation, but the solution isn't to say, let's never talk about alienation or let's pretend that it never happens. The solution is to have proper diagnostic and assessment tools so that we could look at a family and say, dad beat up mom in front of the kids, kids are resisting contact. That does not meet the criteria for alienation. And let's look at another family. Dad didn't beat up mom. Mom is engaged in alienation strategies. Kids are behaving like alienated kids. That does meet the criteria for alienation. So there are ways to tell, looking at the behaviors of all the parties, the rejected parent, the favored parent, and the kids, whether it's alienation or not. We don't need to throw out the construct simply because there are false allegations. I agree. I agree. And, and to me, as I work with the Coalition Against Domestic Violence, I, um, I cringe whenever they don't want to hear the word narcissist or any cluster B personality disorder. They know that they're involved, but it, it's something that um, because of the rules of we can't judge, we can't, you know, claim that they are that, we can't diagnose them, um, they have a difficult time getting funding if they say the word narcissist. And I think that has got to be changed. And I know that you're working towards that. So I think that while it's true, or it's probably true, we don't actually have all the data, but let's say that it were true that most alienators were narcissists. And we don't have that research sewn up, but let's pretend for a moment that we did. I still wouldn't be willing to say because you're an alienator, you must be a narcissist. Or because you're a narcissist, you must be an alienator. So from my point of view, understanding the relationship between personality disorders and alienation is helpful from a treatment point of view. It's helpful for the targeted parent to understand how did this happen? Why was I attracted to a narcissist? How did that play a role in the choices that I made? How can I hopefully not marry and have, a nar uh, have children with a narcissist next time? But I don't think it's essential to know whether any particular alienator is a narcissist. I do believe that alienation is best detected through the behaviors, the actions and attitudes of all of the parties, the favored parent, the rejected parent, and the kids. Yeah, I agree. Um, so let's quickly talk about the court system because people are confused. Is um, parental alienation syndrome emotional abuse? Is it domestic violence? Is it considered child abuse? Well, in the United States, you know, I'm sure you know, there is no one single determination about what the courts, capital T, capital C, believes. And that's, you know, until it, there was a case in the Supreme Court, at this point, it's judge by judge. Some judges totally understand alienation. They understand that it's a form of child abuse. They treat it like a child protection problem, not a child custody problem. But I have testified, not just in the same state, but in the same county, not just in the same county, in the same courtroom, with Judge A in one room and then Judge B in another room. And I have seen tremendous difference between those two judges and how receptive they are to testimony about parental alienation. So it's really a judge by judge um, factor at this point. There, are, there is no the courts understand or the courts don't understand. 
Yeah. And that's, that's, that's very similar to any kind of abuse where um, the legal system just doesn't have a criteria. They don't have a basis. Like these are the rules. This is the laws. This is how we identify them. And, and as you said, it's a judge by judge kind of, of decision. And um, that puts the victim, if you were in the wrong room at the wrong time, that puts the, the abused victim in, in a very bad place where there's no standard. And, and the girl walking down the hall next to you just won her case and your judge didn't help your case that much. Right. So judges have tremendous judicial discretion. And that's because there's a law called the best interest of the child. So it is a federal statute that says when two parents can't agree about the custody of a child, the judge is supposed to make the decision based on what's best for the child. Not Basically, it's not about what's right or fair for the parents or what the parents want. It's supposed to be the child. But where it gets complicated is every state has their own best interest of the child statute. So every state has a law that says when two parents can't agree on custody, the judge makes the decision based on the best interest of the child. And here are the factors the judge should pay attention to when deciding what is in the child's best interest. So in one state, you might have five factors. In another state, it might be 13 factors. It's varied state by state. But where it gets even more complicated is no state statute tells the judge how much weight to give each factor. So let's say you have a particular list of factors in Minnesota. And in Minnesota, it happens to say um, the parent's ability to support the child's relationship with the other parent is a factor. But so is the child's preference. So what do you do if the child prefers parent A, but pa so that goes in parents A favor, but Parent A isn't able to support the child's relationship with parent B. So you have two factors, one in the favor of one parent, one in the favor of the other. The judge has no, uh, there's no rule for how to weight those factors. If we could say to judges, this is the order of importance, that the most important thing is not the child's preference or which parent lives closest to the child's school or something like that. The most important factor should be the parent's ability to support the child's relationship with the other parent. So if we could move the legislation towards that, then I think we would have greater consistency. I would hope that we could get to that place one day because this is an important issue and children's lives depend on this and these decisions that judges are making. Um, and Something that we know about narcissists is that they are charming. They um, very often use the court system to further abuse their victims and charm the judge. And a um, victim is left with their mouth open and in shock, not really knowing how to defend themselves. So what kind of criteria does the court use to tell who's lying and who's not? Right. I, I will add to that that not only do they charm the judges, but they charm their own attorneys, they charm the guardian ad litems, they charm the custody evaluators. That's the biggest problem is the custody evaluators because judges give tremendous weight to the recommendations of the custody evaluator. And imagine the custody evaluator who has a visit scheduled with, to, to uh, have the parent and child come into their office. And on Monday, they have mom and the kid, and on Tuesday, they have dad and the kid. So the custody evaluator opens the office door to the waiting room, and there's the favorite parent with the child. They're sitting next to each other. Their heads are tilted together. They're looking at something together. They're smiling. There's a warm, easy atmosphere between them. That parent, if they're a narcissist, is charming. They're calm, cool, and collected. They know how to make good eye contact. They make a good first impression. Now imagine the next day the custody evaluator opens her office to the waiting room. There's the favorite parent and child in the waiting room. They're not sitting near each other. There's tremendous anxiety and tension in the air. There's hostility between them. The favorite parent, uh, the rejected parent is anxious, agitated. She's afraid that she's losing her children. So she creates a very, very different first impression. She doesn't make good eye contact. She interrupts because she's so eager to explain, no, no, you don't understand. My kids aren't really mad at me. They're, you know, this is just alienation. It's the other parent. The custody evaluator often 
makes recommendations based on how they feel in the room with the parent. So in the room with a, a um, favorite parent who, let's say they're narcissistic, calm, cool, and collected, they have the preference of the child, making good eye contact, not interrupting, very, they make the evaluator feel good about themselves. That's what narcissists are able to do on, you know, in, in a first impression setting. So the custody evaluator says, no wonder the kids want to be more with dad. He's so relaxed. He's fun. They look so happy together. I wouldn't want to spend time with the mother. She's an anxious wreck. All she does is interrupt me. She doesn't, she's so nervous. Her legs are jiggling. I feel uncomfortable with her. No wonder the kids don't want to be with her. So then the custody evaluator will make recommendations in part based on their clinical experience with the parents. And then yes, that does get replicated in the courtroom where favored parents are better on the stand. They make good eye contact, they're relaxed, they look like they're you know, at ease with themselves. And again, uh, the rejected parent is edgy, angry, interrupting, bad eye contact. And so they don't make a good impression. So, and, and that's really how the victim ends up getting blamed for the problem because evaluators and judges will think to themselves, this bad behavior that I'm seeing on the part of the rejected parent, they think that's the cause of the child's rejection. They don't understand that it's actually an, a, a response to the child's rejection. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Um, as we, we go out of the courtroom, and, and, and can we talk about the impact on the child? Because I have so many friends that have um, lost their children or they're fighting for them, and, and the pain is overwhelming, and the stories that I have heard are horrific. Um, and we all understand that the impact on the child, what message is this sending when what parent alienates the other one? What's a message to the children? Well, there's many messages, but the fundamental underlying message is that the other parent is unsafe, unloving, and unavailable. And when kids think, let's just use dad as the rejected parent in this scenario. If the child thinks, you know, dad is a bad guy, he's worthless, uh, he's stupid, everything he does is wrong, what a jerk, he has nothing to offer me. When kids think that a parent is worthless and damaged, they end up internalizing that negativity to themselves because they do think, gee, dad is part of me, either genetically or he helped raise me. So if dad is garbage, then I'm partly garbage too. And then in addition, the underlying alienation message is the other parent is unsafe and loving and unavailable. So if the kid thinks, dad doesn't love me, um, kids often think, well, if a parent doesn't love me, I must be unlovable. You know, they, in, they again, they're, they're not narcissistic, it's called egocentrism. So children think that they're the center of everything, right? So if they spilled milk and then the next day the parents get divorced, they think the parents are getting divorced because they spilled milk. It's just the way a child's mind works. So when mom tells, you know, little Johnny, your father doesn't love you, if he really loved us, he wouldn't have moved out, uh, just to use a sort of classic example, the kids end up thinking, I'm a bad boy, I'm not lovable. So at the end of the day, when a parent turns a child against the other parent, they're really turning a child against themselves. Wow. That just makes the whole core for parental alienation so important because it is the child that will take that on into their life and make decisions based on that feeling of lack, feeling of no one loves me. Um, it just it boggles my mind. Um, so I know that you have eight books out, and I know that you have talked about the um, 18 different types of um, things that people look for. Can you just give us one or two that would indicate parental alienation? Sure. So let me just back up for a moment and say when we're trying to figure out if a child who's resisting contact with the parent, if that child is alienated or not, 
we use the four factor model. So there's four things that need to happen for us to say, you know, Johnny who doesn't want to go visit his mom anymore is alienated. So the first is that there was a prior positive relationship between the child and the parent that the child is now rejecting. So that means that that parent was an adequate parent, a normative parent. They were involved and loving, not perfect, but good enough that the child was able to have an attachment with that parent. The second factor is that the now rejected parent did not engage in abuse or neglect. If they did, we would not call a child alienated if they are rejecting a parent who abused them. Parenthetically, most kids don't, abuse, don't reject even abusive parents. But if they did, we wouldn't call them alienated. Okay. So that's factor two. So factor one, prior positive relationship. Factor two, absence of abuse or neglect on the part of the now rejected parent. Factor three, I think this is what you were referring to, is that the favored parent has engaged in some, does not have to be all, of the 17 primary parental alienation strategies, right? 17, not 18. It's hard to keep our numbers straight. <laughs> um, so there are 17 behaviors that research shows are the kinds of behaviors that can foster a child to reject a parent who didn't do anything to deserve the child's rejection. And then the fourth factor is that the child is exhibiting eight behaviors that are unique to alienated kids. And when you see all four of those factors that take into account the behaviors of the child and each of the parents, when you see those four factors, that child is alienated, not anything else. That's the best explanation for a child rejecting a parent when all four of those things are in place. That makes sense. And um, you can see how that would definitely forecast, you know, beyond belief. I mean, I would have thought that a, a parent that had abused their child and maybe beaten or sexually abused them, that the, the child would want nothing to do with them. But knowing that they don't necessarily reject them, um, but then you've got this clear case of, I don't want to talk to you, you're evil. And, and, the, the conflict between the two are, is a clear indication. That's good to know. Yes, especially if the other things are in place. In other words, there was a prior relationship, absence of abuse, the favored parent is engaging in behaviors that can foster a child to reject a parent, and then the child is exhibiting these eight specific behaviors that even kids who have been abused by a parent don't exhibit towards that parent. So we're really trying with this four-factor model to carve out alienated cases from cases of domestic violence or cases of abuse. Because we would never want to say that a child who's rejecting a parent because that parent molested them or beat them is alienated. We would never, we want to be careful not to do that. Absolutely. There's a fine line there. Um, so what advice do you have for a parent that is co-parenting through this process? What should they be doing if they've got to send their parent, their, their child off to the um, alienator or, um, you know, how do they deal with it? Well, so that's, of course, like the subject of a whole book. So I'll try to just pull out a couple things. So the first thing is, I think you have to start as a parent with a hypothesis, not an assumption. So if your kid starts to be difficult with you, it's easy to assume, oh, my ex is alienating my kid from me. But the truth is, it might be based on, on your own behavior with your child. So first and foremost, you need to make sure that um, you know, you're parenting appropriately, that you're fair, that you're kind, that you're respectful. That doesn't mean there's no rules, but that the rules and regulations in your household are um, implemented, like I said, in a way that's kind, fair, and respectful, so that you don't necessarily assume every time your kid gives you a hard time that it's because of the other parent. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing is, it's also important to make sure that you're not antagonizing the other parent. In other words, are you engaging in alienation, which is fostering anxiety in the other parent that's making them engage in alienation? Make sure that you're not engaging in the 17 primary parental alienation strategies. Make sure that you're being appropriately 
respectful of the other parents parenting rules and regulations even if you don't agree with them that's the hardest thing for co-parents what do you do if you believe in health food or you're a vegan or whatever and the other parent is giving your kid junk food or what if you are very conservative in the way you want your kid to dress and the other one's letting them dress in crop tops and hot pants you know the bottom line is you really don't have a say anymore in what your kid eats and wears or all the other things, what time they go to bed, what kind of movies they watch. Within reason, parents are allowed to have very divergent parenting styles and you should not denigrate the other parent's choices. That is worse for your kid than letting them eat candy or wear hot pants, even if you, you know, that's really not your preference. So those are the two first big pieces of advice. The first is look at yourself and your own parenting, and the other is make sure that you're not antagonizing your ex. Then let's assume you're clean. You're not engaging in alienation. You're really on top of your parenting, and your kid is still reacting to you in unexpected ways, challenging your authority that's not you know, developmentally you know, expected or saying things like, well, you never listen to me, or whatever, doing things that make you think the other parent is engaging in alienation. The first thing you should do is create a journal and really start documenting it. What day, what time, exactly what the kid said. Of course, you don't wanna do that in front of the kid, you know, so you have to sort of keep it in your head and then go into the bathroom and sort of write it down or dictate it into your phone. You need to start documenting. How often is this happening? What is the context? And then if you, if you see multiple alienation strategies happening, it's time to get an attorney. You know, it's, that, that is sort of the number one thing to do as soon as you realize alienation might be a problem. A common mistake is to wait until it's either too late, your kids are completely, you know, alienated from you, they, you know, you're not even having any access or all you're doing is fighting, or the other parent files a motion against you, in which case you basically have two weeks to get an attorney, get them up to speed, and to respond to the motion. So it's better to have a parental alienation attorney ready to go in case you need them to either file a motion or to respond to the other parent's motion, because it's hard to get a good attorney when you're very, very stressed. So the next thing I would say is, do everything you can to protect yourself from false allegations of physical abuse, sexual abuse, and neglect. So that means uh, no corporal punishment. Absolutely, you cannot put your hands on your child in anger, ever. If you feel that you're gonna lose your cool, you walk out of the room. Because the minute you slap your kid or pat them on the bottom in anger, you're gonna have a physical abuse claim against you. Likewise with sexual abuse, don't get under the covers with your children, don't be naked with them, don't take showers with them naked, be super mindful, don't talk about their bodies in inappropriate ways, don't have sex with your new significant other if they can hear you. You have to be, um, I don't wanna say a prude, but very mindful, don't have pornography available, make sure that you have all the proper controls on your phones. These are the things that can come back and haunt you later. Likewise with neglect, make sure your kids always wear seat belts and helmets, don't leave them home alone, don't leave them in the car, make sure that you are squeaky clean. Then, <laughs> I know this is a very long-winded answer. It's good, it's good. <laughs> then you get to the alienation proper. So all of that other stuff is sort of the preamble to what do you do if you think your ex is engaging in alienation. There's a set of alienation-specific parenting strategies that parents need to learn so that they don't take the bait. By that, I mean your kid goes to spend time with your ex, they come back, and they say something. You stole my college money. You never listened to me. You didn't want me to be born. You beat me when I was a baby. I, it doesn't matter what it is. You don't know how to boil water. It could be from the ridiculous to the extreme. The number one mistake that targeted parents make 
is thinking to themselves, my kid is mad at me because they believe something about me that's not true. And what I need to do is to correct the misperception. No, no, I didn't steal your money. I didn't beat you as a baby, blah, blah, blah. And that will fix the problem. And that's intuitive. That's what a normal, rational person would do. My child believes a lie. I just need to tell them that lie isn't true. That doesn't work in alienation cases. So I tell parents in those situations, you are not allowed to say, that's not true. That's a lie. Who told you that? You know that's not true. Did your mother put that idea in your head? Anything like that results in the child thinking, let's say dad's the alienator and mom's the victim. Dad's right. All mom does is yell at me. So the response is not to say, oh, well, if you think I stole your college money, I must have stolen it. And this is where targeted parents get stuck because they think they only have two options, either get angry and argue with their kids, no, no, I didn't do that, or they should give up and say, well, if you think I did it, it must be true. And what they're missing is a whole set of parenting strategies that allow them to relate to their child in a way that corrects the misunderstanding without arguing with them. And that's in my book, Co-Parenting with the Toxic X, and it's also the bulk of my coaching. Parents will say, well, my kid said this, what do I do? And because what I want to do is just pull out the bank statement and tell them I didn't steal the college money, or I tried that and huh, that didn't work. You know, and I can tell them, no, that never works because it's not getting at the underlying problem. When your child says to you, you never listen to me, or you don't know how to boil water, or you stole my college money. What the kid is really saying is, don't you love me? And so the answer has to be designed to address the underlying feeling that the child has that the parent doesn't love them. Wow. That makes so much sense. Um, so if they are co-parenting, that is the book that they should be getting, your co-parenting book, so that they can learn these strategies. And um, I know that you do coaching. And can you just tell us how people can get in touch with you and how they can further learn about this? Because this is such a small snippet. You've got all these books on it. We, we want to lead them to the right information. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the book is called Co-Parenting with a Toxic X, but it's really parenting when you have a toxic ex, because the book is not so much about how to relate to the other parent as it is how do you relate to your child in a way that doesn't allow the poisonous message of the other parent to infiltrate your relationship with your child. So it's really about inoculating your child from alienation. So um, that is the number one book I would recommend for parents who have kids under 18. Their kids are still going back and forth. They're getting drawn into this alienation drama and they need some parenting skills. The coaching just takes it to the next level. So first they read the book and then they're like, yeah, I get it in general, but what do I do when my kid says blah, blah to me? And so the coaching is really about taking the principles in that book and applying them to a specific situation. Um, and so the coaching, there's information about all my books and my coaching on my website. And the directions for people who want to get coaching with me are on the website. Step one, email me. Step two, do this. Step three, do that. It's pretty, it's pretty basic. Okay. And, and we'll put the URL to your website. It's Amy J L Baker. Mm -hmm. Dot com. That's it. Hi. Hey, well, we're going to send people there. And I really appreciate your time. Um, I know that you are a busy woman and you've got a mission here. And we are all in support of everything that you do because you are helping so many of, of my own people and so many people all over the world. Um, so I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart to everyone out there that's going to learn something from this and maybe get them headed in the right direction to where to go for support and help. Well, thank you. You know, we're all, we're all doing our piece, you know? Yeah, we are. So thank you so much. 
You're welcome. Take care. Well, I hope you guys like that. Um, I know that Dr. Amy Baker has been an influence all over the world, and she knows what she's talking about. So if you are dealing with this kind of parental alienation, or you even suspect it, then start to get help. Don't mess with like putting your head under the covers and not facing it. This is the fight for your children. And if you don't fight and if you don't know how to play by the rules of this legal game, then you risk something that you don't want to pay the cost of. And that could be losing your children. I have a friend and I told her that I would share her story because she did lose her children about five years ago, all three of them, to an abusive husband. Um, I've interviewed her on my channel and she hasn't seen them in years. And I asked her, what advice can she give someone who is like her, who has lost them already? And she said, never stop fighting. Never stop fighting to let people know, to raise awareness for this cause. Give it your all because one day those kids are going to turn around and look and they're going to see that you never gave up on them, that you never stopped fighting. Carolyn is trying to change the laws. She is doing everything that she can in her power so that no other parent is subjected to the horrific ending that her story has had so far. So if you're in the situation where you've lost your kids and you just don't know what to do, start to make noise. The bigger the noise, the better. And it's to raise awareness for this horrific, terrible type of abuse. So if you like this video, this is Tracy. I appreciate it if you come in, um, subscribe to my channel. And uh, that's all I got. Thank you so much.